So Job, anybody heard of that book of the Bible? It looks like it's spelled Job, but we pronounce it Job. It's a book that brings with it, it seems, many more questions than it does answers. But it is also a book that is ripe with intense poetry, extreme emotions, and some of the most heart-wrenchingly beautiful words that are recounted by Job, his friends, and of course, our God, as all of them live out their complex and intimate relationships right before our eyes through this book. The story of Job, as a reminder, takes a man who is deemed as upright as you can possibly be, as more righteous than any other, one who devotes every single day of his life to the worship of God, and he lives among blessing after blessing. He's wealthy, he has all this family, he has everything that anyone could ever want. Well, outside evil forces, personified through the Satan, or we might say the Satan, actually translated as the accuser, seek to test Job to the absolute limit by revoking every single thing that he has to prove that man only loves God because of what man has been given to enjoy by God. Job then suffers and suffers tremendously. This morning, I'm going to be reading some of Job's words as he languishes in the worst of it, and then we will be looking at God's response that I will read a little bit later. I invite you, though, to think about what questions you might have for God as you hear these words, and then we're going to seek to make sense of them together. Turning now first to chapter 3 in the book of Job. This is when Job is at his absolute worst. All of his children are gone, all of his homes, all of his livestock. He has lost absolutely everything. He now sits in an ash heap covered in boils and sores. And Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, Let the day perish in which I was born, and the night that said a man-child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness calm it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry be heard in it. Let those curse it who curse the sea, those who are skilled to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide trouble from my eyes." Why is light given to one in misery and life to the bitter in soul who long for death but it does not come and dig for it more than hidden treasures who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way whom God has fenced in? For my sighing comes like my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. And this is the word of the Lord. I think I need to pray. Let us pray. God of grace, God of good things, God of the good word. We pray, Lord, that in the midst of hearing your word that your goodness might shine forth. I pray that your spirit might influence all of our hearts and our minds, and that the words that I speak may not be my words, but they might be yours, and your spirit might flow through them. In Christ's name, amen. Now, Before I launch into the complexities and the depth of the book of Job, but only in about maybe 15 or 20 minutes, I feel the need to explain why I felt called to preach on the text this morning. Because see, normally I would not choose to preach on Job. It's kind of difficult. But when I studied at Union Presbyterian Seminary, now almost 20 years ago, I had a few favorite professors. Now, every single professor at Union is incredible. 
every single one of them. But Dr. Sam Ballantyne, in my opinion, was one of the best. He guided all of us through the study of the Old Testament, and Job happened to be a particular focus of his. He just recently passed away, lost his fight with cancer, and so I decided to pull out his commentary on Job, and then I found it hard to put back down. You see, Job has always been a difficult read for me. I have a hard time making sense of the, of the injustice of what happens to Job and how God responds, and we'll get to God's response later. Even one of the youth at Montreat who was in my small group asked me a question, or actually asked the group a question about Job. The small group leader then stopped and said, Elizabeth, want to take this? Um, I had to stop for a moment to figure out how I would answer it, but I did because Sam Ballantyne's words immediately popped up into my mind. Sam's wisdom and intellect and deep faith they bring a sense of peace, I think, to this torture story of Job. I do admit that most of my understanding of this text comes from Sam Ballantyne, so I give him, but more importantly and overall, I give God's Spirit the credit for much of my words today. In our world, we have a lot of Job's. There are countless lives that are altered by disaster after disaster. Some lives are more akin to our nightmares. Injustice and greed and suffering, they seem to win out more often than not. Job expresses here these words in chapter 3, some that some in our world may know all too well. You see, Job has hit a point in his faith and in his physical life where he can go no further. He has received far too much to handle. He has hit a point in his life where it is too much. We speak at times of the Psalms of Lament. The book of Psalms follows just after Job and our canon. And I've preached on those Psalms of Lament before, lifting up the beauty of what it means to vent to God, to vent to each other, to lament, to express honest emotions in the face of a broken world. It can be healing to let all of that out. These words of lament, they grant us the permission to be honest with our pain, and our need for God in the midst of it. I would wager, though, that the Psalms of Lament, those words, don't even touch the depth of Job's screams in these verses. Job does not simply lament his situation and his experience of losing everything in his life. He does not only curse the day he was born, which has led to this current suffering, but he goes so far, as Dr. Ballantyne points out, to nullify the hopes and the promises attached to each day of the seven days of creation written in Genesis. Job goes above and beyond saying that he wished he was never born. He wishes nothing had been born so that there would be no scrap of this particular life possible, no light of any day that might grace creation which could lead to this kind of suffering. Job is not simply venting. Job speaks into the abyss of suffering, of silent pain and torture, of loss so intense that no one here would be able to understand it. Job utters words that speak with defiance in the face of the divine, as Dr. Ballantyne calls it, the counter-cosmic incantations. Let me say that again, the counter-cosmic incantations. Job speaks into the cosmic chaos, and he gives voice to the broken world in which he lives. Job carries what Ballantyne calls the scandalous voice of defiance, he will continue no longer in silence and loyal faith, following behind a creator he has loved and worshipped and glorified every single day of his life. This God is silent at this moment, but Job is anything but. His defiant voice screams into this insane reality he finds himself suffering. Insanity, that's what this is. There is no reason, no justice, 
His suffering is so deep, he realizes that there is no hope. There is no life. There is no light. Let's take a step back for a moment. It's pretty intense. I think it's important to note that this story of protest in the face of injustice, it's not the first. There are many stories just like this. Dr. Ballantyne goes through all of these different examples of writings that predate Job, including those from regions of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Canaan. They all lift up words and questions which exist in the middle of suffering and violence and torment. I would wager since the very first voice ever spoke, we have been asking, why? The voice of humanity has been speaking since our inception into the midst of this suffering. These earlier texts, though, of all these other peoples, other faiths, they all carry the same theme of the reality of suffering and searching for a release, something to fix it. These other texts, however, they seem to always focus on the eventual restoration of the one who suffers. It all boils down to the gods of their faith will make things right in the end. And all this suffering, there's a reason for it. The one who suffers always confesses some some sin or mistake and repents. So the goal in all of these stories is to restore one's relationship with the divine who will then usher in healing. That's the focus. Job, however differs from these texts because his voice rings out in defiance and actually questions the very God who created him and all that exists around him. The most notable difference from these antecedent versions is that the deities of the ancient Near East and all those stories, they never respond to the calling for restoration and healing. You never hear their voices. As Ballantyne notes, when the author of Job dares to compose a response from God to Job, he breaks rank with all precedent literature. You see, our God ends up answering, enters into the conversation, provides a back and a forth, solidifies that we are indeed in relationship and we are connected in ways that exist beyond any basic human comprehension. This is our God and our story. This is the God of Job. So after that chapter 3 that I read earlier, the chapters then take us on this torturous journey. We hear from all of Job's friends, one after the other. They start off being pretty gentle with Job and his condition. They urge him, turn to God. You need to repent for whatever you did. They do end up getting frustrated with him, just as Job gets frustrated with them. And they try to reason with Job, saying, God has a reason for this. God is still in control. Well, Job continues his defiant voice. He has been faithful. He has done everything that God requires. He is angry, and he holds steady before his friends. For 33 chapters... Job and his friends go back and forth while they push him to repent, but it's not until chapter 38 when God finally speaks. And God speaks through an extraordinary divine presence of majesty and grandeur. We know it in the theological world as a theophany. Let me say that again. A theophany can say maybe you learned something today at church. This is when God speaks in this particular extraordinary way. That's what a theophany is. A theophany is when God chooses to speak to us through, say, a burning bush or a pillar of fire or an angel in the middle of a furnace. Or in this case, God speaks through a whirlwind. These incredible moments of the Creator coming into our midst defy understanding. They overwhelm the expected and the normal and the ordinary. God rushes in to Job's extraordinary suffering and stops Job's protests by speaking to him. And so we turn now to just a portion of how God responds to Job. Chapter 38. The Lord answered Job 
out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked shall be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. And this, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So on the first reading of God's response, and it continues very much the same for several chapters, it's unexpected. You expect God to step in and comfort Job, to answer his questions, to ease his pain. God, instead, it seems, is pretty condescending. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Who are you to say such things when I am God? But then if you look closer, God's role in this trial where Job is now on the stand and God speaks of things that only God can know, the inner workings of this creation that we are part of, this very creation that Job cursed as he sits in his pain. God is this ancient architect who formed every single piece of life. Brennan Breed, a professor at Columbia Seminary, another good seminary, points out the description of God serving as a mother who births the sea. The metaphor for the sea at that time and even now is chaos. In the Psalms and ancient Babylonian texts, they envision the sea to be a chaotic monster who threatens the break, to break the stability of the cosmos, of existence itself. This chaos, the sea, was birthed through the waters by God, and God immediately clothes the chaos. It says that he wrapped it in clouds, swaddling it with darkness, creating its bounds and containing its movement and existence. The chaos then, the pain, the brokenness, the suffering and the destruction is not evil, but it is part of who we are. And God seeks to hold everything of who we are together, even when it hurts. Breed further says, the unpredictability of life, the unpredictability of life is not evil, nor is it evidence of God's disorder or failures. God is the God of the sea monster of chaos too, and the chaos works through our lives as well. We die as parts of our lives are bruised and broken, which then makes way for new things, for different growth. The chaos, you see, is necessary. But Job and the words of God remind us that our defiant voices are still need to rise up. There's still questions with no answers, right? You know, I think about this quite often, especially when someone is in pain and they just want to know why. And I think maybe, maybe we already know why we suffer. We just haven't discovered it yet. Maybe the answer wouldn't even make any sense. 
That's why we still ask why. But when God finally speaks through a whirlwind, we hear words not necessarily answering all of Job's questions, but we hear words that reframe who Job is, who we are, and where we come from. Words that recall the majestic and intricate workings of the cosmos, of creation, of the chaos and the order, the pain and the peace, the righteous and the sinner. This story about Job, I think, reveals an incredible truth embedded in our faith. And that is that while our God is mysterious and powerful, our God is also present in ways that we can't even imagine. Our God shows up when we scream at him, and our God responds. As I was reading reflections on Dr. Sam Ballantyne's life after his passing, I came across words that were written by Walter Brueggemann. Brueggemann is one of the greater modern theologians of our time. He shared beautiful words outlining the incredible impact that Dr. Ballantyne has made on the world, especially his study and his words on, as he calls it, the reality and practice of prayer in the Bible. Prayer, after all, is the way by which our relationship with God even becomes a relationship. And books like Job demonstrate how we get to go back and forth with God. We're not telling stories from ancient days, thousands of years ago, where we endure our suffering, we repent of some mistake that we've made, and peace, come, and peace comes and we never hear from a divine voice. No, our story is different. Dr. Ballantyne says, prayer becomes a means of maintaining a balance of power and the divine human relationship, and if necessary, a means of redistributing power so that the human partner is not squeezed out of the process. He says, I suggest that Job's new vision is informed by a new understanding of what it means to be fully and dangerously human. He has learned that human beings may image God not by acquiescing to innocent suffering, but by protesting it, contending with the powers that permit or sustain it, and when necessary, taking the fight directly to God. My friends, we are called to enter into an intentional prayer life where even we, like Job, may utter counter-cosmic incantations. And though we may at times suffer through silence, we know that the creator of all things, the one who even holds and cares for chaos, speaks a presence of majesty and love into every single one of our lives. And my friends, that is where our hope lives. That is where our promise of new life continues on. And we may know that in each and every moment of our lives, as difficult or broken as it may be, our God shows up and responds and is present in all of his majestic power. To God be the glory. Amen.